So first of all, I'd like to say that it's a great uh, honor to be one of the speakers at this conference. And as Sylvain told you the story, we were invited when it was supposed to be the 60th birthday. So it's a sad occasion, but I would like to thank the organizers for going ahead and organizing this uh, wonderful event with all of us and with the tribute day on Thursday. So thanks for their work. And um, I should also start by saying how I first met uh, um, Jean-Christophe Yocos. So I was an undergraduate student at Scuola Normale. Um, I defended my thesis in 2002. And Stefano Marmi was my advisor, my undergraduate advisor. He had just arrived to Scuola Normale at that point. And he organized a wonderful uh, activity at Centro de Giorgi. And Jean-Christophe was one of the participants in this activity. And uh, so that was still an undergraduate student. And I also remember at that time, uh, Jean-Christophe and, and Stefano, who were long-term, long-date collaborators, had just started after, for a few years to explore the world of interval exchange maps. So I remember as a student at some point going to Stefano's office and Jean-Christophe and Stefano were drawing Rosy classes, Rosy diagrams at the board and learning from the papers from Vich and uh, Zorich about Rosy Vich induction. So that's my first memory of them discussing it. And I was very much intimidated by him. And then throughout the years, I kind of had, of course, uh, I kept meeting him at conferences. He invited me in Stockholm a few times. And in uh, Paris, I met him. And we had several mathematical discussions. And he was very supportive throughout my whole career. So I was very in depth to him. And then uh, we had started um, discussions which led to what I'm talking today. So today, I had basically no choice, no brain, brainless choice about what to speak, because I'm speaking of joint work with Stefano Marmi and Jean-Christophe Yocos. And we started discussing about this a uh, long time ago. And at some point in October 2014, uh, after he had already been unwell and he was starting recovering, he actually came to visit me in Bristol for a week. So I have this great memory of this week. Uh, part of this week, Stefano was also there, and we had dinner together in restaurants and lots of mathematical discussions on these topics, which, according to Stefano, were quite heated. According to me, I have just very enjoyable discussions all day with him. So, And then I think we met one more time in Lumini, and uh, Stefano had some more discussions with him on this in October 2015. So that's the last, one of the last things that he was thinking on with, with us. OK. And... Uh, OK, so uh, I'll start with a little bit of tour. Of course, there are in this audience some of the people who made the story of uh, Birkhoff sums for interval exchange maps happen in the past decades. But I'm going to give an introduction for people who are not experts in the audience. And hopefully, there are many who don't know the whole story. So let me start with the objects. So we should call them interval exchange maps and not interval exchange transformations, because that's how Jean-Christophe liked to call them. So interval exchange maps are piecewise isometries of the interval. And just to recover, re repeat some notation, you need, uh, it's a map of uh, uh, the unit interval. You need an alphabet. And Jean-Christophe started using letters, a, B, e, a, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, epsilon, say, for five interval exchanges. And uh, you cut your intervals into five subintervals of different lengths. And you give yourself a permutation, which tells you how to rearrange these intervals. Each one is rigidly moved by, a piece, by an isometry. Yes? Can you do the, the X to each other? Sorry? What you have to do is really extend yes, the Yes, you just add the... Tra to the next to each other. Uh, you want to say my open here, yes. What? Yes. You, yeah, you're right. That's true. That's a typo. Yes. And uh, let me tell you... Um, there's a small thing about notation. You could write an interval exchange with uh, only one row of numbers, which tells you the order after. But uh, Jean-Christophe started using two rows, one above, one below, which tells you the order before and the order after, because this allows you to keep track of names associated to intervals. And this is a very small notational exchange, but really it made a huge difference in some sense because all the works by Marmi Musain Yokoz and then Avila Guezel Yokoz were based on this little improvement on not well, not based. The starting point was to have this little improvement in notation. So it's a smart little uh, comment. Okay, so we'll use Yokoz notation. 
And then we prescribe lengths. So this, uh, this is this lambda are just the lengths of the corresponding intervals. And then I want to give myself a function on the interval. And to introduce some notation, I want to study Birkhoff sum. So I will call S and F. This is just, uh, I start from a point X in my interval. I'm just summing my function along the orbit of X. And in m most of this talk, I want to focus on the simplest case, the finite dimensional case. I want to look at a function which is piecewise constant and piecewise constant on the intervals which give me the interval exchange transformation. So we call gamma of t the functions which are piecewise constant with respect to the intervals on which t is defined. And you can think of piecewise constant functions as vectors in Rd, where d is the number of intervals, right? So I just, the vector entries are the values on each of the five intervals in my example. And we are gonna mostly look at functions with mean zero. So mean zero functions are just the hyperplane in this R finite dimensional space. And there is a parallel geometric object. And since I gave, I'm giving my talk after Kurt, so you've already heard all about flat surfaces or translation surfaces, better to say. So these are surfaces obtained by gluing polygons, uh, by uh, identifying opposite sides by parallel translations. And they, are, they have a flat metric with conical singularity, so I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna need them much. So I just want to tell you one concrete way to represent, well, typical translation surfaces. You can choose for um, a polygonal presentation made of rectangles. And again, I'm not going to be very precise, but this was something that Veach introduced and called zipper rectangles. So for example, you can build uh, one of those surfaces by identifying rectangles and using the, an interval exchange to glue the top with the bottom and zipping together the sides of these rectangles in some way. So if this rectangle R alpha will have some length, R alpha, and some height that I will call Q alpha throughout the talk. And then there is another parameter which is the height of the zips that you want to glue rectangles together from the bottom and then differently from the top. And it doesn't matter, but actually it's length and permutation length and uh, yeah, permutation lengths and heights of the zips are coordinates on translation surfaces. And uh, they univocally determined the heights, so just a technical point. And I also want to tell you that the permutation knows about the surface. So the from the permutation only you can recover the genus and the number of these uh, uh, conical singularities of your, and there is a formula, D is 2G plus K. Uh, K minus one, sorry. <laughs> K minus one, that's a typo. And, uh, okay, and if you look at uh, what is called the vertical linear flow, so you move along lines in the vertical direction, uh, which is well defined if you don't hit a singularity, the Poincare session is an interval exchange map, and I, and I can look at ergodic integrals, so the function on the surface, defined on the surface to R, and I can integrate it along the flow. Okay, so these are the two objects. Just remember an interval exchange, pi uh, lambda, and a surface, pi lambda, and tau. And this is also a very basic slide. So first, the convention, when I say almost every interval exchange map, you want to assume that the permutation is irreducible. This is a condition which is required for minimality. And just you mean almost every choice of the lengths. So almost every IT sync just means uh, choosing at random the lengths. And on the other hand, there is a notion of almost every zipper rectangle or almost every translation surface. And uh, there is, this is with respect to what we now call the Mazovich me me measure, which is essentially Lebesgue measure on lambda and tau. And the seminal work of Mazur and independently each in the 80s, we know that almost every interval exchange or equivalently the vertical flow on almost every translation surface is uniquely ergodic. So this tells us that if I look at uh, the Birkhoff sums of a function or, uh, along an orbit, they will be small o of n. So they go, will go. So if I take a function which is mean zero, when I divide by n, I will go to zero. And similarly for the ergodic integrals. So 
if you want to know what is the size of this error term, you want to study deviations over ergodic averages. And in this setup of piecewise constant functions, uh, one seminal uh, paper by one of the first papers by Zorich uh, tells you that for, if I just pick a piecewise constant function, constant on the intervals, uh, and the function, and, and assume it means zero, then there exists some exponent gamma, which is between zero and one, so that the Birkhoff sums have a polynomial deviation. So they are bounded above by n to the gamma, constant to the n to the gamma. So these are polynomial upper bounds on uh, deviations over ergodic averages. And you can ask what are the lower bounds? So are, low, are, are deviations really polynomial? Well, uh, that depends, and it actually depends on the piecewise constant function that you picked. So in this toy model of piecewise constant finite dimensional space, remember when piecewise constant function is in R5 in my picture, and for almost every IT, you can find a filtration, and I'm just having three parts in this filtration, F minus, F0, and F plus, nested subspaces, and this one has dimension G, G is the genus, this one has an extra k minus one dimensions, so uh, where k is the number of singularities, and uh, then there are another extra g dimensions, so this, remember, d, the total dimension is 2g plus k minus one, so g and g, uh, and k minus one in the middle. And what about these three spaces? Well, so if I am in f plus, but not in f zero, then I truly have power deviations. So, you have this, if you look at, if you take the log of your Birkhoff sums and divide by log n, the limb soup is positive. So this tells you that infinitely often, for every point, your sums will be greater than something really power-like. If you are in this F0, but not in, okay, if you are in F0 in general, actually, your, if I take the log of my Birkhoff sums and divide by log n, this is zero, so this means that your deviations are sub-polynomial. So they have an epsilon. They are smaller than any epsilon power. And, and if you are really in this F minus, this G-dimensional space, well, your Birkhoff sums are really bounded. So there is no deviation at all. So here I'm assuming that my interval changes, say, has that some diophant time condition. And, and in this case, your function turns out to be a co-boundary. So you can write it as G composed with T minus G. And, uh, uh, okay, okay, so this is the baby picture for piecewise constant, but in greater generality, uh, mm, if you just look area-preserving flows on surfaces and sufficiently smooth functions supported outside the singularities, there is this um, result by Forney in 2002, tells you that ergodic integrals actually have uh, mm, a, a much finer expansion, a power spectrum. So I don't want to enter into detail, but first of all, this is a result which is more general because it's not for this finite dimensional space, but really for an infinite dimensional space. And it's much more precise, so it tells you that an ergodic integral grows like uh, the integral times t. If I integrate up to time t, I grow like integral time t, plus, and then there are some terms which grow like powers uh, with some constants. And uh, these constants are given by uh, Forney's invariant distribution. So there, there's a functional on your space which tells you whether these constants, the value of this constant. Uh, and uh, what do I mean by this uh, twiddle? Twiddle is not a precise statement. What you mean that if the first i minus one of these distributions are zero, so the first constants are zero, but the di one is different than zero, then you really have new i grows. So if I take the log of the integral and divide by log t, the limb soup is uh, this new i. Uh, so it's a power spectrum, very precise information. And these numbers, this new one to new g, are Lyapunov exponents of the Tech-Muller geodesic flow. And I'm not gonna tell you if you, you maybe you'll hear more later. And uh, the Konsevich zorich conjecture was, a f uh, was about simplicity, so proving that these are all distinct, and this was uh, the breakthrough of Avila and Viana 
published in 2007. So this is just a little bit of history for people, so, as a, made by people in this room, so it's a little bit more. So it looks like we have a very precise picture, so what, why am I giving this talk? Well, I want to make a point that we can say something more, which is beyond uh, the asymptotic size of your fluctuation. So, so far we just said how, if, and how these deviations fluctuate around the mean. But you can ask more uh, final information. What, for example? So if I fix a function, keep it, stick to piecewise constant, fix a point, I can just plot the graph of my Birkhoff sum. So what do I do? So my x-axis is uh, time in unit intervals, say, so n, k from 0, 1, 2, 3. And I start, I fix a point, and I start by plotting the function at x0, f of x0. Then I plot f of x1, I, I, sorry, I add f of x1, so I plot uh, the Birkhoff sum at time 1. Then I add, uh, am I following the orbit and adding uh, the values of my function? So I'm computing the Birkhoff sums as k of f for k from 0, 1, 2, dot, dot, dot. And uh, I also want to connect them to have a linear plot, a fine uh, graph, okay? So this one, a piecewise affine function with vertices k, comma, sk of f at x0, which is the, uh, the point that I fix. Okay, so I'm plotting the values of my Birkhoff sums as I go along. And if I plot this, I might as well decide to rescale my graph to make it size 1. So I look at intervals 1 over n. And now let me give you a little example. And I want to thank Stefano Marmi for the following pictures. It's just a simple, you can just take maple and run a plot. And uh, um, the, what I see will depend on these three spaces, F. Oh, they were supposed to be F. OK, I think I changed the typos, but maybe, OK. What I was calling F my, F, now they became E. E minus E0, E plus. So if I'm plotting in this g-dimensional space where Birkhoff sums are bounded, that's an example of the plot that I see. You see, Birkhoff sums are bounded, so my graphs stay in a strip. And uh, this is a case of a pseudonosal, which is easy to plot, but it's really the picture will look something like this. If I plot in E plus and not in E zero, a function in which is truly has power deviations, that's an example of what I see. You see, this is a nice graph. It looks like something which has a fractal structure, but it looks very different than this. I hope you all agree. <laughs> And what about E0? What about this uh, sub-exponential uh, deviation, sub-polynomial deviation, but really not bounding? Well, that's an example of what the, the graph that you get in for a something in E0. And I hope it's visually very clear to everybody that this is quite a different picture. So, co-boundary, bounded, po power deviations, very nice fractal graph. And then you have this behavior, which I hope you will agree has something of both. So it has wide-ranging fluctuations, but it also has some kind of, it's like a phantom graph. Huh? What is fractal here? I mean oh, no, I'm just saying that there are scales, we will see later, there are renormalization scales. So there is yeah, no fractal, in, no, in the sense of, in the sense that if I zoom in, I see some picture which have, if I go on a very large N, there are scales which are built out of previous scales, but in the we will see. It will be clear at the end that there's really some fractal something. Okay, so today I will focus, so our joint work is about the behavior of the central picture. What can we say for about the central picture? And that's one of the starting point of our conversations. But um, for the history, I will start by saying something of the last case, sorry, which is, um, ah no, first I want to convince you that uh, this picture is interesting, that it is worth studying, because usually when people study deviations over ergodic averages, they restrict themselves to either positive or negative exponents. So this zero case is not so much explored in some sense. So first, let me give you some examples where you see this sub-polynomial uh, deviations. Uh, first of all, the basic example we shouldn't forget, if I just take a rotation, uh, rotation, I think I'm using the copy which is not the last. It should be t plus x plus a here, okay. Um, and I look at the characteristic function. So characteristic function of the interval zero b, and I center it, so I remove b, so it means zero. And uh, 
So if B belongs to the orbit, oh, sorry, this is also, uh, if B to the or belongs to the orbit of zero under the rotation by A, then you really see a co-boundary. So this is a plot for the rotation of the characteristic function of uh, zero A, A, probably, that also Stefano, I thank Stefano for the pictures that allows me to show some graphs. And, but if <laughs> this condition is not true, maybe I should say for typical A and B, you will have that your correct, correct this mean zero characteristic function actually belongs to this uh, zero space. So what you see, uh, this is a plot for the rotation. It's a plot of the middle nature that I showed before. And so this doesn't exist only for rotations. If you just look at 90 where this k minus one is positive. So if you take a permutation which corresponds to a surface with, where there are at least two singularities, for example, uh, the permutation where you reverse the order when the number of intervals is odd, then you always have a non-zero, uh, this k is always greater than one. So you have uh, piecewise constant functions which behave like this. And maybe let me tell you the third case, which is what we were more curious about, what I call corrected characteristic functions. So I, I start with a characteristic function of an interval zero beta, uh, zero b, sorry, zero b. And then there is a lemma that we proved with Stefano and uh, Jean-Christophe. So this characteristic function typically will have a power gross, will not have, but I can correct it. So in the spirit of what Marmi Musa Yokos do with their correction operator, we, ha we have this lemma. I can add a piecewise constant function so that the new characteristic function, I can kind of, I, I leave the break point at B. B will always be a jump by one, but I can adjust the values on the other intervals so that I actually see sub-polynomial behavior. So it's in, you are in a finite dimensional space and this is still giving you a, a, a corrected function which has the right, uh, the, the, the sub-polynomial behavior. And why should we be care about, uh, again, this uh, corrected characteristic function? Well, let me tell you, in the case of rotations, there's lots of interesting uh, theorems which describe the behavior of this of, uh, characteristic function. So first of all, you can give very prescribe, precise estimates on this uh, sub-polynomial uh, growth. For example, in terms of uh, Ostrowski expansion, there is a literature in number theory about the discrepancy theory. And there are interesting um, uh, limit theorems. So you can randomize some, quant some variables and say something interesting. For example, if I look at this characteristic function and I randomize uh, x, the initial point, and the rotation number jointly. So I pick, I put a Lebesgue measure on x and alpha, and I study the behavior of these Birkhoff sums. It turns, I think of them as a random variable, and if I renormalize by one of L again, you can prove that the distribution of this random variable converge to Cauchy. So this is a theorem by Keston. And uh, another example of a limit theorem where you have some extra um, randomness is the theorem by Beck, which is a sem temporal, what, uh, what the Gopiat and Sarig would now call temporal distributional limit theorem. So if I look at the quadratic irrational, a rotation number like square root of two and at zero, I can actually, I can randomize time. So I can p I look up to n, I can put a uniform distribution I can, between one and n. So I can pick k at random before, between one and n. And it turns out that I can center and rescale my long, suitably my Birkhoff sums to converge to Gaussian. So it's like it's a limit theorem, like a central limit theorem, but along an orbit with randomized time. And just to mention, there are, there's a new geometric proof using translation surfaces and the Vich group of an affine uh, of the staircase of an uh, infinite, sorry, not affine, infinite translation surface of this theorem by Beck by uh, Avila, Durayev, Dolgopiat, and Sarik. And they also have generalized it. Well, uh, this is not, published but to bounded type for uh, beta rational. And in joint work with my postdoc, um, Michael Bromberg, we recently proved uh, that you can, this temporal CLT for a bounded type and uh, irrational values of beta. So this is just uh, aside. Okay, so 
this is a question I'm not going to answer this today, but the question could be, can we try to prove some of these results for corrected characteristic functions? And for example, in this back central limit theorem, we are working with Michael for uh, uh, in the setup of an interval exchange transformations. It looks like there's hope to generalize this type of results. Kesten is more mysterious. And uh, this type of corrective characteristic functions do arise in geometric setup when you study some Z covers of infinite translation surfaces. So there are many cases where ergodicity is studied for some infinite trans linear flows or infinite translation surfaces, and they give examples which fit in this E0 type of growth. Okay, so actually, I think all known ergodic examples correspond to growth which is subpolynomial currently. So that's my, one of my motivation to study that. Okay, so motivated enough, hopefully. Let's go back to what can we say. And I want to back up a little, and I want to start by telling you about this behavior, about the positive, the, the case where you have really a power behavior. When the soup of log of the Birkhoff sums divided by log n is positive, and I mean E plus and not in E zero. And I want to, I think there is, a, so I claim that you can say something about this picture in terms of what Jean-Christophe and uh, Stefano and Pierre Moussa called the limit shapes. So I'm gonna tell you, uh, it's a little piece of uh, hidden in one of the papers one with, of Jean-Christophe with uh, uh, so Manuel Moussa Yokoz, and it's, a paper that they have on a fine interval exchange transformation where they construct wandering intervals examples, building on the work of Cobo and Camelier Gutierrez and Bressor, uh, Uber and Mas. So, and inside this paper, which I want to advertise it because I think it's not so much known because it's inside this paper, but it's independent. It's a result about uh, piecewise isometry, about the standard IT case. They, they introduce this concept of limit shape. So that's what I'm gonna tell you next. What is a limit shape of a Birkhoff sum? Wandering is different from wandering? No, wandering is supposed to be, it's a type of course. You're spotting all the typos. So we started with, Giovanni told me the collage had the wrong accent in the first slide and now, I think I'm using a version, I had corrected some of those and I think I opened the wrong file, so sorry for. Yeah, to my students, I give a candy for spotting typos in my lecture notes, but I won't do this here, so don't, you can tell me later after the talk all the typos. So can, okay, um, and I want to say that this concept of limit shape was in some sense discovered independently and in a different language by uh, Alexander Buffetov. So Buffetov has a big paper on Anna's limit theorems for translation flows, and he builds an object to prove limit theorems for translation flows. It's in the continuous time case. And he builds what he calls finitely additive transverse invariant measures or Hölder cycles. And uh, these uh, limit shapes of Marvin Musayo Kos, it turns out they didn't talk to each other, of course, but, and they didn't understand the different language for some at the beginning, but it turns out that these limit shapes are in some sense a plot of these objects that Sasha introduces along the leaves of your flow. So they are intimately connected, but I kind of like limit shapes a lot because I think they're very easy and more concrete. You can get the hold of them easier than maybe reading Sasha's paper. Okay. Okay, so you can ask, let's, let's go back to my plots when there is this power deviation. So that's my plot that I called fractal and I want to justify what, what does it mean. Okay, you can ask, stupidly I can ask, look, it looks like a nice graph of a function. Maybe when n grows, does this thing converge to a function and a graph? Well, first of all, clearly you should say all, no, clearly not, because we just said that we are assuming that there are really oscillations, so this thing is growing, it cannot converge. Okay, but let's rescale, we already rescaled the x-axis to zero, one. So let's rescale also the y-axis to put my object in a box of radius one. So let's rescale, let no, me not be precise, let's rescale by the size of the oscillations. Well, then do I see convergence? Well, no, because if you just do a few of these plots, you will notice that as n grows, I rescale every time to put myself in a box, but I see different shapes. I don't see the same shape. But, so I can say, oh, I'm lost, and then there's no regularity. What else can I say? It's is moving, it's oscillating. But well, 
that's the inside, actually you can say something. You can say that you are converging to, I like to say, converging to a moving target. So you are approaching an object, which is the limit shape, which is moving. And it's moving driven by uh, the renormalization you're using to study, which could be Rosevich induction in the case of marmion Sayokos, or it's the same thing on the continuous side, the tech Muller geodesic flow that we heard about in the previous, well, yeah, of sort of heard. Okay, <clears throat> so I want to explain this meaning. So I want the next few slides, I will try to make precise what I mean by converging to a moving object. And uh, <clears throat> I'm gonna follow, as I said, Marmion Sayokos, limit shapes and not Buffetto's formalism. And so I want to use Rosevich induction to define a limit shape. So, and I have a little spoiler, so I hope not to lose anybody, but if you, the spoiler is that if you are in this central space, that now became F, it was an E, sorry, so it should have been F all the time. Actually, you are also converging, but you're not converging to a limit shape, but you're converging to a limit distribution. So there will be, this, this is the spoiler we will get to there at the end. So the, Okay, so now I need to tell you uh, something about Rosevich, uh, the Rosevich algorithm, which is the renormalization algorithm to study interval exchange transformation. So this is a crash course, so I don't need to tell you precise definitions, so I want to just, the picture is that you start with an interval exchange, and the algorithm gives you a sequence of nested subintervals. I n, I, I one is a sub, sub interval of I zero, which all share the left end point. I two is a smaller interval and so on up to I n. And I'm assuming, I guess the king, con I'm assuming that this process goes on forever, which is true for almost every I t. Uh, and how are these intervals chosen? Well, in particular, I want that if I induce on one of these sub intervals, so if I look at the Poincare map of an orbit I look at when it returns to this small interval, it should be an interval exchange of the same number of intervals. So if I start with five intervals, the algorithm will produce a sequence of five interval exchange transformations on smaller and smaller intervals, which are given by Poincare maps. And there is a, in parallel, we have two objects, interval exchange maps and translation surfaces as the zipper rectangles. So if I start by lambda and pi, I get a sequence of lambda n pi n. If I start by a zipper rectangles, which has three coordinates, lambda, pi, and tau, then I get in the same way a sequence of zipper rectangles. And as I move down, the zipper rectangles have shorter base, uh, uh, narrower bases and higher and taller heights. So you get a sequence of zipper rectangles which shrink in the x axis and become elongated in the y. And the element on this level of the level of zipper rectangles, so the elementary move of the algorithm is just a cutting and stacking operation. So at each point you cut one rectangle or a piece of a rectangle and you stack it on top of another rectangle to create a new rectangle. So it's a cutting and stacking algorithm. And the other remark that I want to make is that at this level, at the level of the surface, so if I just give myself lambda and p, the interval exchange, I can only go forward. I can only, I can only know how to go forward in my algorithm. But at this level of uh, rectangles, it's actually invertible. So I can also go backward. And I really want to go backward. That's why I want to say that. Okay. And then, what is the Rovzivich cross cycle? So, if I start from my zipper rectangles and I run my algorithm by doing cutting and stacking, I get a new longer and taller, uh, smaller and taller rectangles. But these rectangles are actually made of pieces of the previous ones because I cut and stack, cut and stack, and these tall rectangles are made by the original rectangles by cutting and stacking. So I can define matrices just by counting, so my matrices are indexed by the colors of the rectangles, so I can fix one color, uh, beta, and another color in departure, alpha, and count how many pieces, uh, how many blue pieces, how many alpha pieces I see inside this long beta tower. So this is an integer number, and if I record all these numbers, these intersection matrices, these are 
what are called Rosevich matrices, and they give the Rosevich co-cycle over the renormalization. And for the purpose of this talk, let me always think that I didn't tell you what the algorithm is. So I'm actually using what you cause introduced uh, with Marmi Musa as positive acceleration. So I want to wait until my matrices are positive. So until inside each one step, we'll have the property that each long tower contains pieces of all colors. And uh, Ozelladet's theorem and uh, the symplectic nature of these matrices. So here, um, they would tell you that actually for a typical, uh, for almost every initial uh, zipper rectangle, there are Lyapunov exponents. So this product of matrices has Lyapunov exponents, and I think we'll have much more from Marcello's talk. And in this case, Lyapunov exponents come into pairs. So for, for every positive, there is a negative. And uh, my space, my RD, on which this product, these are D by D matrices, and they act on RD. So RD has, a, um, if I fix them also a past, has actually, a di it can, you know, I can write it as a direct sum of eigenspaces, one for each exponent. So there are positive exponents, negative exponents, and zero exponents, okay? And, and, and here in the i's eigenspace, if I take a vector in the i eigenspace and apply my matrices, my uh, matrices B, now this should be a B, so the log of the norm grow, divided by N grows like mu i, the i's exponent. And there is a relation between these eigenspaces for Lyapunov exponents and what I had in a few slides above, the decomposition of functions. You remember the functions which have um, power deviation actually correspond, are really made by this uh, uh, so sorry, the function which are co-boundaries correspond to these negative exponents and the ones which truly have uh, positive power deviation correspond to positive exponents and in the middle we have the zero exponent. Okay, so we are ready to build limit shapes now. So I take a function in an EI which corresponds to a positive exponent. So this function really has power deviation and I want to go in the past. I nearly need to go in the past. So in the past means, that's why I need to start from a zipper rectangle so I can go back. And I said I can run my algorithm backwards. So in the future, my algorithm gives me taller and narrower zipper rectangles. In the past, it gives me larger and short zipper rectangles. So this is the algorithm backwards. And now I want to build the limit shape for you. So what do I do? I fix my present. Let's fix a tower, say the first. And as you see, my first tower, if I look at ta vertical direction, it's, uh, uh, I can write it as union of these uh, smaller towers from the past. So as I go up my tower, I cross different, so different uh, short rectangles. And this is what I'm putting in my time axis. So I'm using, in time intervals, I'm using these uh, uh, heights of the past rectangles. And then I want to plot, uh, I start from a function, and the function also I can bring it back with the cocycle. So I can look at, uh, I have my original interval exchange and original heights and original function, and they produce a sequence of backwards interval exchange backwards heights, which are smaller and smaller exponentially, and functions in the past. And what I want to plot is the function of the past. So I want to plot the Birkhoff sums of the past in time intervals, which are this uh, size of past towers. So I can do this plot. <coughs> Sorry? Oh yes, possibly. Uh, two brown here. There are two brown, and this is. Two, I, I may imagine that it's the same value twice. For example, it's in, I, two still, but yeah, yeah, it's okay. So what I claim that if I go even backward, so even farther back, my time intervals will be much s smaller. So I and and if I do the plot of the function at some time minus n, which was before minus n, actually the graph turns out to be just a refinement of the previous graph. So if I go back, I see that my graph is becoming finer and finer, so, but it shares the same vertices. I'm just adding extra vertices. 
So I go through the same points, but in between I go to some more points. So that you see the, the time axis is getting finer and finer because I'm moving by intervals which are exponentially smaller in the past. But the functions are coherently defined so that the Birkhoff sums interpolate each other. It's just a relation between Birkhoff sums. So if you keep going, so you, you imagine you're kind of, you have this plot of a piecewise affine function. At the next level, you make each piece uh, finer, and then each piece even finer. And you're adding actually increments, which because of the positive exponent, are getting exponentially smaller with a different rate. So the x-axis is getting finer at the rate of the first exponent and uh, in the past, and the, the y-axis is getting smaller in the rate of the second exponent. So what do you see? That's Marmi Musayo cause. This is almost immediate from the definition. Here you really see convergence. So as you do these plots backwards, you converge to a graph of a function. And this is the limit shape for the ice exponent, if I start with. And this limit shape is really a graph of a function, which is Hölder. And the Hölder exponent is related to the ratio between the exponents you're plotting. Oh, sorry, I said second, but it could be i, it's a positive exponent. OK, what's the application for Birkhoff sums? Well, the application is that if I, I, I converge, OK, let me say. Say that I plot my Birkhoff sums up to time qn, where qn is the height of a future rectangle, so it's exponentially large. And I rescale my graph to make it size one, and that's an example of a plot. I claim that as n grows, my plot of Birkhoff sums is getting closer and closer to a limit shape. But it's not a limit shape of the present, it's the limit shape of the interval exchange at the nth future step of renormalization. So the plot up to time qn, up to exponential scale, is approaching, the rescale is approaching the limit shape for tn, the future of the renormalization, okay? And so I'm really not converging, but I am, I am getting exponentially close as I go to the limit shape of a future of my renormalization. And this is really all the convergence that there is, but it seems like, but you are really building, uh, you are, Re reducing your study of Birkhoff sums to an object that you understand over the Teichmuller flow or over Rosevich induction. And for example, Sasha Buffetov proves uh, some limit theorem. So for example, if you are on a periodic orbit, then at exponential times, you will really see the same limit shape and you can prove something. Or if you come back, with, if your renormalization is recurrent at times of returns, you also see convergence. So you can describe weak limits. You can describe the convergence subsequences that you see. Was there a question? No. No. Okay. Okay. Now, what happens if we try to do the same for the zero space? I can do exactly the same. I give myself a zipper rectangle, so present and past. Uh, I go backwards. I get skinnier and skinnier rectangles, and I bring my functions backwards with the, with the cosine curve. And now I do the same. I plot my function at some scale, and then as I go back, I will get a finer plot, which shares the vertices of the previous, and it's finer. So everything is uh, the same in terms of the construction, but because I'm not starting from a positive exponent, but from a zero exponent, Actually, the size of the oscillation is not shrinking. So, so what happens that clearly this, I mean, picture is a, sorry. Uh, I, so the idea that before you had really steps which were getting exponentially smaller, and here steps are all of the same size. So if I add up finer and finer jumps of the same size, I cannot converge in the sense of function, okay? So there is no convergence as graphs, but, <clears throat> in this joint work with Marmi and uh, Jean-Christophe, what we realized that actually you, there is a limit object, but it's not a graph. It's really a distribution. So first of all, you need to assume a suitable Diophantine condition. You need to assume that your data satisfy what we call the dual rot type condition. And under this condition, this is my plot, this is my uh, limit shape, this limit shape doesn't converge as a graph, but it converges 
if I integrate it versus a Hölder function. So if I just take a function which is Hölder with some Hölder exponent between zero and one, then when I integrate my limit shape against this Hölder function, it's like a regularizing kind of factor, then I converge to a limit object, a limit distribution, okay? So it's a distribution on Hölder function. And <coughs> this is the, mm, the result that, uh, uh, we, so actually the, we have a manuscript which is <laughs> large we discussed and then in large part uh, Jean-Christophe wrote and, and, and then we have a separate note on this rot type that we are going to merge together in this. And we are trying to finish up the, <laughs> the but, so what is, so first let me point out, first of all, there is no, no, in this picture, there is no need to rescale the Y coordinate. So I'm not doing anything on the Y coordinate. I just have this finer and finer graph and I have this limit object. So you could up, have a corollary for Birkhoff sums and it would be for weighted Birkhoff sums. So if I have this Birkhoff sums, if I weight them with the Hölder weight, so this is something the number theorists like to do, to put weights on your oscillating function. If you have a weighting, Hölder weight, then you converge in the same sense you were converging before. So you converge to an object which is moving driven by renormalization. And finally, in some sense, there is some intrinsic in interest because we had these objects, these limit shapes, turned out to be associated to um, uh, the correspond the, the something that live in absolute homology, and they are dual to Forni invariant distributions, as uh, Buffetov shows in his paper. And um, somehow here we have some intrinsic objects which are associated to these relative homology bits that usually people discard, so there is some uh, limit objects that are associated to relative homology classes. And, uh, um, Okay, so some tools in the proof. So first of all, it's key in the whole thing. The, there is a key concept of duality, and it's duality between space and time, where space for me means going vertically in my vertical flow, and time, uh, sorry, time means going vertically according to the flow, and space means moving horizontally, and you can think of this as the horizontal and vertical flow on your translation surface. And there really there's a key duality that also Sasha exploits in his work. And then we need a new Diophan time condition. So uh, I, I, I have a few more slides that I would like to tell you, but we'll tell you a little bit more. This dual type Diophan time condition. And this involves a dual of the Rosevichko cycle and the dual of special Birkhoff sums. So Marmi Musayokos use special Birkhoff sums to study Birkhoff sums, and you need a dual version to define this condition. And another comment that I don't want to go into. We can also prove this theorem, but there's also another, there were two, uh, in my abstract, there are two new Diophantine the conditions. One is the dual and one is absolute uh, rot type or absolute dual rot type. And let me tell you a motivation. If I look at these corrected characteristic functions, I really want to fix the point uh, where my function jumps and then have a Diophantine condition which is independent on the marked point. So I want a condition which depends only uh, actually on absolute homology and not the marked point. So we define also, uh, we define this absolute dual rot type and in parallel we also define an absolute rot type which is this, the non-dualized version. And um, this note, I said I, we are gonna merge when, uh, um, also a note with Jean-Christophe where um, it turns out that all the works that um, Marmi Musayokos did on the cohomological equation actually hold under a weaker assumption than what they assumed. So they assume the rot type and you can do it under what we call absolute rot type which is weaker than rot. Okay, uh, this I have just three slides I had a little bit of, I don't know how much I want to go into but so I want to say, what is rot type? So if I have a rotation number, these are continued fraction entries and these are denominators of the continued fraction. Rot type means that the entry of the continued fraction expansion grows, that should be a constant or an order, grows at most, it's big O of QN to the epsilon for every epsilon. So the entries grow less than uh, the denominators to the power epsilon for any epsilon. And uh, <coughs> yes? Sorry? You write there exists a C. Yeah, there should be there exists a C such that An is less than constant Qn to the epsilon for every, ep yeah, for every epsilon there exists a C. So yeah, so it's, uh, 
yeah, it's, but there should be a big O. I wanted to put a big O and it's another typo, yes. <laughs> another candy, yes. Okay, sorry. And um, so Marvin Mustayokos in 2005, I guess, for the cohomological equation, introduced an analogous rot type condition for interval exchange transformations. And I cannot state it all because it consists of four, uh, four properties on the Rosevich matrices. Uh, there is a matrix gross, a spectral gap, a coherence, and if you want a restricted row type, a hyperbolicity condition. I'm just gonna write the first, which is what we care most. These matrices that I produce with counting these intersection numbers of rectangles, so these matrices play the role of entries, of the multidimensional entries of continued fractions. And you want a condition about gross, like the norm of the nth matrix, oh, there's an epsilon missing. This should be less than constant, this norm to the epsilon for every epsilon. So the, the, the nth matrix is less than the product of the first n to the power epsilon. And, uh, okay, this condition was key. It's what they used to solve the cohomological equation. And let me don't tell you what the cohomological equation is if you don't know. You can correct, okay, that's okay. Um, and, uh, okay. So everything here, the matrices act on RD, which you can think of as the relative homology of your surface. So this condition is in terms of relative homology in some sense. And what I mentioned is called absolute homology, absolute rot type. You can actually see the absolute homology as a subset of relative homology. Uh, this is, absolute homology is more natural geometrically, but it's harder to, it's hidden in Rosevich induction from the, it's hidden in the combinatorics. So you can actually modify this condition A to use uh, a positive acceleration for absolute homology. And this is technical, I don't want to. But I just wanted to say again, as I said already, so you can use this weaker absolute rot type condition to reprove the results on the cohomological equation. And this, there was a separate motivation for this that Eskin and Chaika proved a beautiful result on Ozelades genericity. For any translation surface, almost every direction is Ozelades generic. And uh, they show in their paper that this absolute rot type condition uh, holds for every translation surface in almost every direction. And um, John was just in Bristol a few weeks ago and he convinced me that you can actually also show directly from their paper that the rot type, as it was written in Marmi Musayokos, also holds for every translation in almost every direction. But this was maybe not evident at first. So, uh, as a corollary of this absolute rot type, we also know now that all translation surfaces in almost every direction satisfy the rot type condition, the absolute rot type condition, and hence all the results on the cohomological equation that were proven in a series of papers by Marmi Musayokos. And this dual rot type, uh, okay, I think I'm running out of time. So, okay, you want to run your uh, rotation uh, your Rosevich induction backward. So first of all, you need to prove that uh, you can do a positive acceleration. So if you know what that means, that if you go in the past of your Rosevich induction, you get paths which are infinitely complete. And just to say, there is a small lemma which will appear in this uh, joint work as an appendix. That it's a very sophisticated combinatorial proof that Jean-Christophe wrote by himself, like we, we had this issue of oh, how do we accelerate, how do we make sure that, and everybody says Jean-Christophe was very strong in everything, but in combinatorics, it was really where he showed, and, and he really kind of deal with combinatorics in a very impressive way, so this is a, a small, a small ex of the many examples where you could see. And once you have this positive acceleration, you can define a condition which mimics this uh, rot type for the going backwards in the Rosevich induction. Again, it's a gross, and then again, there's an epsilon missing, yes. And then you have similar conditions to, to add. And we can show that this dual rot type also has full measure. Okay, uh, this is the last slide. I wanted to make the connection, if you ever were curious, about this duality. Where does it appear in this theorem about uh, distributional limit shapes? So as I go back from a step uh, minus n to a step minus m, I need to compare the difference between two of these Birkhoff sums, of these plots. And uh, there's a nice rescaling property, which is maybe this fractal nature. So the difference between these two Birkhoff sums 
it's a sum of rescaled versions of a Birkhoff sum for a time m minus n at t minus n. So there is like a co the cocycle relation gives you some kind of self similarity between pieces. And if you want to study the difference, you want, so this difference is made essentially, but only there are only D types of D difference, difference shapes. And uh, each time that uh, a certain uh, letter occur in your time axis, you see the same pattern. So these blue patterns are the same over the times that my, um, uh, as I go up my rectangle, I was cutting these blue past rectangles. And when I want to study, want to sum over these light blue occurrences, what I'm really doing, I'm studying a, 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 a sum for the horizontal flow. It's like I'm traveling on my horizontal and I'm uh, recording and on the horizontal flow when I hit a certain rectangle. So this is kind of the duality, and that's as much as I can tell you. So you use this duality between vertical flow and horizontal flow to prove this convergence. And uh, I think I told you even more than what you wanted to hear. So thanks a lot. And this is where I stop. Thank you.